being young and not very happy, I was getting ready to get myself into trouble. So I sat down one day and I talked to my sister. And she said, well, Vernon, why don't you go join the Army? So I went down to the recruiting station. And I walked in and there was a big, fat, burly guy sitting behind, big sergeant sitting behind the desk. He looked up and said, what do you want? I said, I'd like to join the Army. <laughs> and he looked up at me and said, we ain't got no quarters for you people. Well, that kind of turned me off, so I left there. So I went back and I couldn't find another, I couldn't find a job for about three months. And in June of 1941, I told Cass, I'm going to try to go back to the, and join the Army. And I was all, the adrenaline was flowing because if this same guy was back in there and he treated me that before, I was going to punch him in the nose. <laughs> but I walked in and there was a very pleasant young looking, looking sergeant sitting behind the desk. And he said, uh, can I help you? I said, uh, and I still had my hand on the doorknob. And I said, yes, I'd like to join the Army. And he said, well, come on in and sit down. So I sat down. He said, well, what branch of the service you want to go in? And I said, quartermaster. And I was watching when he was writing down, and he wrote down infantry. I didn't say anything because I was in. Upon enlisting in the Army in June of 1941, Vernon Baker was assigned to the segregated 370th Regiment, the first black unit to see combat in World War II. Common at the time was the practice of placing black fighting units under white officers, a condition that occasionally heightened the existing tensions of combat. On April 5, 1945, Baker's unit was ordered to assault the German-occupied mountain stronghold near Vareggio, Italy. Numerous Allied battalions had already tried to take the heavily fortified position, but none were successful. There were three hills, uh, X, Y, and Z. And we went from X to Y to Z and then to the castle. The whole regiment had been trying to take Castle Aganolfi. And battalion by battalion, they went up. They got cut to pieces. And when they got back down or were driven back down, we knew it was our turn. There was a nice path going up the hill. And I'll bless Captain Rundy, and I'll always bless him for this, even though I didn't like him. He walked up on the outside and, st and stayed on the rocks on the outside of the path. And I was right on his heels. When I got up the top, I heard explosions behind me. That was some of my men in my platoon that stepped, they walked in the center of, of the path, and they were stepping on these mines. We started moving up wide. We got out. And down and there was a big deep draw. I didn't know how to navigate it. And Captain Runny got up to me and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. When this German came out right below us, he stopped and he saw us and he took this potato masher and threw it at us. A kaleidoscope of things happened. Captain Runny yelled and jumped up and almost knocked my rifle out of my arm. I'm trying to level my rifle and shoot and I finally shot him before he could get out of sight and the grenade didn't explode. It was a dud. Somebody was sitting on my shoulder. I don't, I, I don't know. I was looking down the path, waiting to see if there was somebody else coming up there. And Sergeant Dickens came out, came running out with, with, with a submachine gun. He carried a submachine gun all the time. And uh, uh, he asked me, he said, uh, you OK, Lieutenant? I said, yeah, I'm fine. He said, I'm going down to see, him, see, see what's down there, because nobody else came up. And so I started down, and he said, wait a minute. And he tossed me his submachine gun, so I took it and uh, took the submachine gun and went down. I, I was just full of adrenaline that day. So I went down and started curving around back into the hill, and I saw this uh, door off, of, off a car in the side of a hill covering the entrance. So I took a grenade. I had four grenades with me, and I took, took a and pulled the pin and I moved away from it. When I flew open, nothing happened. And I was just getting ready to go to look in, in the hole and the German stuck his head out. He was half asleep and he stuck his head out looking around. So I shot him in the head. 
and I went on down and tossed a grenade into the to the opening, and there were three more in in there. I went on down a little farther, and there was another dugout, and I just took a grenade and tossed it in there, blew that door open, and there were two more people in there. Sprayed the place with the machine gun, cleaned it up. After that, I went back up on the top, and when I got back up on the top, they, they found out we were there. They had located us, and mortar and machine gun. The castle was just saturating the area. And I located Sergeant Dickens, and I asked him, I said, where's Runyon? And he didn't know who Runyon was. I said, the company commander. And he said, oh, he's in the house over there, a blockhouse, a little blockhouse. He was in there. He was sitting on the floor with his knees rolled up like this. He was sitting on the floor and he had his, had his head down below his knees. And when I walked in the door, he looked up at me and said, Baker, can't you get those men together out there? I looked at him and I told him, I said, I'm, I'm trying the best I can, Captain. And then about two or three minutes later, he said, Baker, I'm going back for reinforcements. Well, I got my senses together, and I told him, okay, Captain, you go ahead. We'll be here when you get back. I knew he wasn't coming back. Deprived of command and control and taking heavy losses, Baker's platoon was left to find its way back to the Allied line. The next morning, Baker voluntarily led a battalion advance on the German position, routing the superior force and securing Castle Agonofi for the Allies. Every once in a while I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the guys. I think of 19 souls that gave their all for it. If not for them, I probably wouldn't be here myself. Baker's actions in the battle earned him the Distinguished Service Cross. In 1996, more than 50 years later, he received a call from a man working on a federal grant to reassess the role of black soldiers during World War II. He said, I'm Professor Gibran from Shaw University, and the United States Army has given us a $350,000 grant to research into why no black soldier had received a Medal of Honor from World War II. President Bill Clinton awarded Baker the Medal of Honor in January of 1997, making Vernon Baker the only living black serviceman from World War II to receive the honor. The black soldier was very much ignored. And I feel that the black soldier made quite a contribution to winning the war. They were wonderful soldiers.